Um, and so that is its own entity. Um, and we still don't understand the pathogenesis. And we're not 100% sure that those cells are technically protocytes. They're in the right location, and they resemble those cells. But it might be that they're a de-differentiated form and are like pre cortisite So again, all that's molecular, all that um, uh, research-based, although there are definitive classic cases in humans that cause collapsing variant of FSGS. And it's very important for the MD nephropathologist to recognize that lesion because those patients progress to end-stage renal disease much more quickly than patients that have typical FSGS from just regular protein. Um, and the two cats that we've had that have had the collapsing variant, um, that we said it resembles the collapsing variant, one of them, we got a necropsy sample, so we don't know how it would have progressed. And the other one um, we is from UC Davis, and I haven't gotten feedback to figure out if the cat is doing better. Both of them were young cats, though. So that might be something that we'll investigate in the future. But we have not seen a collapsing variant in dogs. I have seen protocyte mitotic figures in a single dog once, and it was one single mitotic figure ever. Um, OK, NC State had a quick question. Did you want to repeat that? Because I can't see the chat. No, oh, that, that, but it's more questions about um, uh, some s subtle densities n near the glomerular basement membrane that might be um, uh, immune deposits, and I mean things like this. And uh, again, once you appreciate that the uh, co uh, consolidation or condensation of uh, actin uh, filaments in the podocytes that are uh, rearranging their cytostructure uh, can end up making a, a somewhat electron dense regions. Um, that, that, that explains most everything that even comes close to being uh, a suggestion that might be misinterpreted as an immune deposit in, in this image, I think. From a diagnostic standpoint, remember that I'm the one doping them, and I can go to really high mag and look at them very closely. Um, and if it's from a board standpoint, I think it would be very unfair for an exam committee to give you an EM without also giving you the associated immunofluorescence image. So from a board standpoint, they would give you a classic you know, membrane and a classic, very granular IS photo. But from a diagnostic standpoint, I get 50 images. Well, I don't, I don't take 50 images, but I look at a whole bunch of different capillary loops, and I take representative pictures from like 10 to 12 of them. So, uh, from a diagnostic standpoint, I can go and make sure and verify that there's no that those are active filament condensation versus immune deposit. Um, so, you know. Uh, don't get too worried about this kind of thing and figuring this out on boards because it, it wouldn't be a, a fair question on boards if they didn't give you an IF. Um, and plus, it would mean that now you have to interpret multiple things, and that's why boards would like it. So. Um, OK, so I think we can go to the PowerPoint unless there's any other questions about this panel. <clears throat> NC State, did we answer your question? I don't know if you can type. I don't know if I can see the chat. Thank you. Thank you, NC State. OK, so um, this dog, I gave you a hint to Google. Um, and that's just because I knew that our residents had seen this material before, so I didn't want other residents to be at a disadvantage. Um, this case was um, a case uh, oh, sorry, uh, uh, putting all this together with the global foot process of basement um, and with the very minimal changes via light microscopy. This case falls into the category of minimal change disease. Um, and so uh, this particular dog was on um, uh, therapy for uh, metastatic mast cell tumor. So she was on a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Um, and she'd been on it for about five weeks. Um, interestingly, the package insert tells you to check a UPC every two weeks just to check um, because and they say if you detect proteinuria, you should stop the drug. So the dog had normal baseline, had a normal two-week evaluation, I think, or something like that. She had a normal UPC after being on the drug for a bit. 
then at five weeks she had a UPC of 20.8, so she spiked her, her UPC. Um, and at the same time, she was hypoalbuminemic around uh, 1.2, so that's severely hypoalbuminemic. The clinician astutely stopped the drug um, and um, then was tracking the dog. I think over the course of the next week, she become, became azotemic. So proteinuria was detected, I think, maybe 7 to 10 days before azotemia developed. Um, the dog was hospitalized. She was being treated with multiple supportive care. They were getting ready to biopsy her. Um, there have been previous publications about um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors causing minimal change disease in dogs. Um, they contacted George to do a biopsy, but the dog uh, quickly became aneuric and had aneuric renal failure, so they euthanized and immediately took samples post-euthanasia for, um, for processing by us. Um, so the samples were of good quality, even though the dog, uh, even though they're not technically biopsy samples. Um, and so um, this uh, case is a case of minimal change disease. It has a specific um, progression that we'll talk about on the next PowerPoint slide. But this PowerPoint slide is basically only talking about minimal change disease itself. Um, minimal change disease was named minimal change disease because there are minimal changes in the glomerulus via light microscopy. Um, and it is uh, a podocytopathy or maybe just podocyte injury or degeneration. Um, but those podocytes are technically sublethally injured. They shouldn't detach. Um, they shouldn't die. They're just, they're reversibly injured. And so, um, if you do EM like we did, you see global foot process abasement, and that's about it. That's pretty much the, the linchpin for the diagnosis, is seeing global foot process abasement in a severely proteinuric patient. Um, you should not see evidence of segmental glomerular sclerosis. If you see segmental glomerular sclerosis on the biopsy, the diagnosis is now focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. It's no longer minimal change. So if you think about it, minimal change disease should be on the reversible side of the spectrum, and you should have focal segmental glomerular sclerosis on the other side of the spectrum. It's possible that at one time you could get a biopsy and you would only see evidence of minimal change disease, but if that cortisite continues to be injured and eventually does die and detach, it could progress to focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. And then you biopsy them two months later, and now you see segmental glomerulus growth. Does everybody get that? Okay, I'm getting head shaking from OSU, so I'm assuming they're getting. It. I'm assuming it makes sense. Um, so um, the minimal. Oh, sorry. Go back and warm the slide, George. Um, uh, so in humans, um, they either rem if, if, the, if they have evidence that the podocyte has been injured by an exogenous stimulus, maybe drug exposure or something like that the first line of treatment is to get rid of the offending agent. Um, and then in humans, they often give steroids. Um, and that's an issue that I just want to mention. In humans, we give steroids for a lot of glomerular diseases. Um, we tend um, not to suggest steroids in dogs because dogs are so incredibly sensitive to steroids and become um, um, push or have symptomology of Cushing's disease. Um, in humans, they do have a lot of uh, anecdotal and um, uh, folklore that steroids are protective for the photocyte and so it might help the photocyte heal. We don't really have that type of um, background data in dogs. So a lot of times when you Google this disease and you look at all the human literature, you would think, oh, we'll just do what they do in human diseases, but we really don't believe in that same kind of philosophy of steroids being cytoprotective or photocyte protective. They might be, we just don't have enough data. Okay, next slide, George, sorry. Um, so minimal change disease as a syndrome is the most common cause of proteinuria in children. It's usually young boys that are maybe like four to five years old and they become severely proteinuric. They don't really biopsy these dogs. Or, sorry, these children. <laughs> they don't biopsy these children. They usually start a course of corticosteroids and the child resolves, the proteinuria resolves. Um, and that's part of the background data of why we use steroids in humans for this disease process, because they just did it back in the 60s and the 70s, and they're like, hey, it works. We're not really sure why it works. It's probably protective of the photosynthesis. It is a very, it's an infrequent cause of proteinuria in adult humans. Um, there are many other 
that would be on your differential list if you had a proteinuric adult, but it does happen. It's extremely rare in small animals. Uh, we, it's less than 10 cases in our biopsy service, and we have more than 1,000 biopsies in our service. Um, in humans, they're not, um, usually associated with recent medication use. This is adult humans. That last bullet point should say adult humans. So NSAID therapy is associated with minimal change disease. Again, the theory being somehow the NSAIDs have injured the porticite. And in that species, the published um, literature are TKI inhibitors or tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Sorry, that should be TKI, not TKI inhibitors. Apologize. But anyway, so uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Um, we have also seen one case on our service that we at least uh, temp uh, linked to d, d penicillin use in a dog that was being treated for copper storage hepatopathy. So, um, that, uh, so we ha there are probably other drugs that can um, insult the protocyte in veterinary. Um, and we've had one cat recently that we could not find an offending drug at all. After multiple questions from the owner, they had no evidence of toxicity or drug exposure in one single cat. So that might have been spontaneous. Of course, the cat didn't uh, answer the question. So what exactly happened to the cat is unknown. <laughs> okay, um, and so now this particular case is the tubular um, evacuation of the big protein cat. Um, and, and with the progression of disease that we saw in this particular patient, it was minimal change disease that, per, that was associated with um, uh, acute renal failure. So in humans, there is a minimal change disease with acute renal failure syndrome. So basically just add two different syndromes together and have an even longer disease name. And um, it's a well rec so acute renal failure is a well-recognized sequela of, um, a, of minimal change disease in adult humans. Kids rarely become azotemic when they have minimal change disease. So adult humans with minimal change disease can have um, a late onset of acute renal failure, um, and usually they'll be proteinuric for a couple weeks, just like this dog was, and then progress to becoming azotemic. Um, there is a lot. There are a lot of theories of how this would happen. Um, nothing has been um, completely um, identified as being the source of the acute renal failure in a subset of these patients. Um, and so some of them think it's um, related with the therapy of using the diuretic from these severely um, proteinuric patients. Some of it thinks the, some of them think it's the proteinuria itself, that very heavy load of protein going through the tubules and an abrupt onset might injure the tubules themselves. There is a recognition, recognition that endothelin-1 um, variants um, are associated with this progression to acute renal failure. Um, so there's a lot of random molecular theories, none of which have been associated, or none of which have been identified as, as being the only pathogenesis. Um, but the syndrome is that you have acute onset of proteinuria and then you progress to azotemia. Um, and you see acute tubular epithelial injury. And like George said, some of that vacillation um, could have been associated with the treatments that this particular dog was doing for supportive care. Um, I think they gave the dog mannitol, and we often see the vacillation with mannitol therapy. Um, but this was really extensive throughout the course of the slide, and there was a lot of very um, dilated tubules and even those singly necrotic apoptotic cells. So this was more extensive than what we see with just regular mannitol therapy in this, in this particular um, case. Um, and the reason this is important is that um, human patients with this combo of minimal change disease and acute renal failure have a worse prognosis than if they presented with minimal change disease alone. Um, they usually require dialysis and it takes longer for them to recover. Um, so uh, it, it's one of those things, I think, diagnostically, if you're looking at a biopsy from a patient and you see severe um, uh, tubular injury and the patient is severely proteinuric, Look at the glomeruli. If you can't find any disease in the glomeruli, then say, you know, there are syndromes where you can have minimal changes in the glomeruli resulting in severe proteinuria, and that will progress to acute renal failure. Um, we would need EM for all of this. So that's why I like my job, because I can suggest doing EM, and then they do it. So 
Um, okay, so moving on, because I'm kind of rambling at this point, let's move to case two. Sorry, George. Um, and Jeremy, you ready to take this one? Sure. Rachel, how's this for volume? Is that way too loud, or is that okay? That's good for me. Is everybody else okay? okay. Sounds good. Excellent. Um, okay, um, so in the H&E, um, what jumps out is segmentally the tuft is distorted by this aggregate of uh, highly vacuolated kind of variable size vacuoles uh, within these cells. Um, who these cells are, I don't really know. Um, and in some cases, nuclei appear nice and central, and in others, they're uh, peripheralized by these vacuoles. Um, around the periphery of that aggregate, though, I think the capillary lumina are still uh, are still open, and you can make them out, and they've got nice uh, nice thin walls. Um, and then, of course, podocytes uh, podocytes and the, the uh, parietal epithelium are hypertrophy uh, multifocally. Um, and then at the uh, kind of 12 o'clock position, there's some expansion kind of between the uh, uh, between the uh, parietal epithelium and Bowman's capsule. There's sort of a, a zone of increased matrix um, that I'm not sure. I suppose we'll talk about that a little bit. But um, I think that was it for for the H and E. Uh, kind of very similar on the on the PAS, the vacuoles within those cells are are for the most part PAS negative. There's a little bit of debris that's kind of weakly positive, but most of those vacuoles. So I don't think it's glycogen. Um, and then you can make out again in that weird uh, unusual zone at, at 12 o'clock that there's a little bit. It looks like a kind of basement membrane, almost uh, positive strands between the uh, epithelium and uh, uh, Bowman's capsule. Okay. Um, and then trichrome, uh, kind of similar, <laughs> kind of uh, the vacuoles, there's no contents really staining up very well. There's a little bit of a collagenous, perhaps, uh, matrix surrounding those cells within that aggregate. Um, and then I thought it was interesting that in the in the tubules surrounding the glomeruli, there was quite a lot of uptake with the uh, kind of red staining on the trichrome. Um, I'm not sure what to do with that. I don't think it's muscle, but um, depends sometime on, on the actual trichrome stain how red the cytoplasm of the epithelial cells looks, and it may just be that that this is a a, a bit more red ish. Um, uh, uh, example of the trichrome. Okay. Um, and then in the silver, it's kind of interesting that the, the cells do, um, the cellular contents in the aggregate uh, do pick up some of the silver stain. Um, kind of, it's kind of a heterogeneous sort of granular uh, staining to it. And then some of the some of the vacuolated areas might actually that are that are not picking up any stain may actually be the, the capillary lumina perhaps that are entrapped within this area. Um, I don't know what you thought or if they're or if they're cells that simply the contents are not staining, but um, I was curious how you would uh, interpret that. Um, Some of them l look like just holes uh, in uh, in. in as opposed to now, this looks like it, it might pass for a capillary lumen entrapped in this, but I have a harder time with that one, uh, or that one, or you know, a couple of these. But but on a individual one after another basis, you you get into some ifs ands and maybes that you can't really tell. I yeah. think. Um, but otherwise, uh, smooth, regular contour. Uh, so I mean, one feature of this is that uh, the this lobule that's uh, you know clearly uh, advanced, uh, affected in an advanced way is uh, adjacent in the same glomerulus to law. For instance, this lobule, which you know by itself um, pretty much passes for normal in all of the the images that we've looked at. So, okay. Great. 
of the EM. Um, so there are, I can make out a couple capillary lumina. The one has um, two uh, erythrocytes in it. Um, around those, there are, uh, as we've noted before, some, some, uh, some fusion and uh, uh, kind of loss of podocytes. Um, I thought all the way to the left, they were a little closer to normal, but... Um, you mean in uh, here? Again, they're starting, yeah. But um, I think they're. Again, well, you get you get a sense that they once <laughs> once were separated, but they're not right. they're not normal, uh, of course. But um, and then down at the yeah, kind of that area, the bottom thirty percent of the image, um, we kind of have some cells where I can't quite make out cell borders, but the the cytoplasm seems to contain some heterogeneous uh, content. You've got a couple maybe membrane bound. Uh, uh, vesicles or, or uh, lysosome-like structures, perhaps. Um, and then some have heterogeneous content, uh, some very electron-dense material, and then others are kind of a little more homogeneous. But um, again, I wasn't sure. I suppose this is what was picking up some of that uh, silver stain, is this heterogeneous content. But um, yeah, uh, I think that's all I had about that. And the IF, um, we sort of have a kind of a global staining here, uh, but it's not, it doesn't seem specific to any particular area. It doesn't match up with that aggregate, I didn't think. So I, I kind of thought this was perhaps more nonspecific staining. Yay! Okay. <laughs> you got it right. right. IF is the hardest thing to, to practice, so. So even if you have an IF panel, it could be that it's just a negative or non-specific panel. So. Okay, so what's your diagnosis, Jeremy? Um, so I think this is segmental um, glomerular lipidosis. Uh-huh. And um, um, your comment in your previous report that you wrote to Dr. Baden? Um, so I dropped your name and said that um, previously you had said that uh, you're thinking it's kind of a variant of focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. Um, yeah, so and I think we can move to the PowerPoint and um, I think all of your points were, I think you did a really good description. Um, I have had a previous question um, about what happens when you get a panel on board that has four identical lesions all on special stains. And I honestly I haven't been on the board's exam committee, so I don't know how they deal with it. If I were going to do it to save time, I would say the H&E, PAS, trichrome, and JMS stain all show blah, 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 <laughs> segmental effacement of a capillary loop by lipid-laden cells. And then I would say they are not PAS positive. You know what I mean? Like I wouldn't repeat myself over and over again for all the stains just at the same time. I don't know if that's the way the board committee would like it or not. And, I, and that's how my reports have been with you guys when I sent you out the answers per se. I basically said they all show the same thing and this is what you specifically see on trichrome, and on the Jones thing, you specifically see this. Okay, so that's an aside. Um, particularly with this case, um, this case was a year and a half old uh, male golden retriever. He had um, persistent subclinical, which meant the dog did not have any clinical signs, but his UPC was persistently um, abnormal at 1.9. I did want to take a quick moment to mention the concept of nephrotic range proteinuria versus nephrotic proteinuria versus renal proteinuria. <laughs> So, um, nephrotic syndrome means you have at least, two, you have multiple indications of nephrotic syndrome. You're proteinuric, hypoalbuminemic, you probably are hyper, hypercholesterolemic, and you might have some edema or ascites. You have multiple manifestations of the syndrome, of nephrotic syndrome. If you have a UPC that is, well, it depends on where your cutoff is, but if it's greater than three definitively, even if you don't have the systemic manifestations of nephrotic syndrome, you can call that nephrotic range proteinuria. Sometimes people drop down that cutoff from 3 to 2.5. Some people even use 2, so it's not standardized. But basically, in human medicine, if it's greater than 3, they would say nephrotic range proteinuria, and they don't even care if the patient has ascites or has hypercholesterolemia. They just think that that proteinuria is nephrotic range. Um, so that's my little aside about about 
that concept of nephrotic range coat area versus nephrotic syndrome. Um, the dog's creatinine was normal, it was 1.1, he was not hypoalbuminemic, he was mildly hypertensive. Um, this owner, I think this dog is from Tufts maybe, um, and the dog had had a positive Lyme serology, and the dog, their previous dog had had Lyme disease in the past, um, and so the owner was really conscientious about getting a biopsy early before everything started going bad for this dog. So they got a biopsy. Um, and what we saw was the exact same lesion Jeremy just described um, with, that affected many glomeruli. It wasn't just that single glomerulus. It was probably half the glomeruli had that segmental effacement by those bone cells or those um, So this diagnosis of lipid glomerulopathy or glomerular lipidosis, both of those are used synonymously. Um, and um, it is a segmental lesion, that's one of the keys, it's segmental. Um, they are lipid-laden iral macrophages, although there is some evidence that they could be mesangial cells as well. Um, so I probably will correct that before I send it out to you guys after this round. Um, sometimes it's easier just to say foam cells, then you're not committing yourself to a, to a certain cell type. Um, Glomerular lipidosis is listed in Jevon Kennedy as an incidental lesion. That's totally incorrect, I think, in my opinion. Um, in some of our cases, it is the only lesion we identify in dogs with certain area. Um, most of these dogs, when I went back and tried to look at them as a group, most of them are fairly young. Um, and I don't know if those lipid-laden macrophages are causing the disease or if the disease is somewhere else in the glomerulus and those lipid-laden cells are coming in to clean up debris, I don't know. I don't know the, yes, uh, sorry, we have a question here from OSU. So, uh, I, I assume that the, the statement is that the lesion comes from cases that, that had no proof or no real, I don't, you know, had well, no so if you look at the actual, if you look at the actual paperwork or the original papers for, they called it incidental, it's because these dogs weren't azotemic and they never reported a UPC. So if you see one glomerulus with this lesion and you're looking at a cross-section from a necropsy case, whatever, you can ignore it. I won't be mad at you. <laughs> if you have a biopsy and the dog is still alive and you see this lesion, then I would ask about a UPC. They probably shouldn't be doing a biopsy if they haven't done a UPC anyway. But, um, but to me, um, the reason that they were considered as the dental is because they were using azotemia as their disease state and they weren't looking at UPCs in these dogs. So these papers are from like the 70s and 80s. Um, and interestingly, like Jeremy was saying, it might be a variant of FSGS. We did a cluster analysis with cases that have immune complex disease, cases of amyloidosis, cases of focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, and these lipid, uh, glomerular lipidoses all seem to cluster phenotypically with FSGS. And in fact, it actually closely represents this variant of FSGS in humans, which is called the cellular variant of FSGS. And I think the next slide has a picture of a uh, case in humans. So not nearly as extensive as what we saw in our dog, but this is lipid-laden cells inside the lumens of capillary loop um, in the cellular variant of FSGS. And again, this is a really kind of unknown pathogenesis in humans. They recognize it in that cluster of FSGS spectrum. But it's another one of those, hey, if you see it, this is what it is. I don't know how it got there. <laughs> um, so whether or not our dogs have original podocyte injury that allow these capillaries to aneurysmally dilate, and now these foam cells are coming in secondarily, or vice versa. Maybe they have some weird kind of phenotype in their bone cells, and that's causing the glomerular capillary to dilate. I don't know which. Um, but this is a human picture right here. This is from one of the publications of the different um, classification systems for focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. And I think we can round out with just other fun lipid, glomerular lipid abnormalities that are seen in dogs. These will not be sent out on the PowerPoint because they're being written up for publication, so I, you'll, I can't send them out yet. Um, but this is actually a fun lesion that we've been seeing in um, a few dogs, all of which are miniature schnauzers. So it might be a breed-related thing. Um, we've seen it in four dogs 
out of our thousand biases, all four have been miniature sounders. Um, and so you see those really prominent, clear, open spaces. The first time I saw this, I thought it was a processing artifact, and I ignored it. Well, actually, I didn't ignore it. I did comment on it, because at one point I went back and Google, or not Google, I did a, a, a text search in our database, and I was able to find that case. But I didn't call it as a lead, I just mentioned that there were these aneurysmally dilated capillary loops. So, this is so the question here is, do these miniature sensors have hyperlipidemia? That it, it's not as severe as some of the miniature sensors that we see. Um, we actually have a geneticist at University of Minnesota who is helping characterize these miniature sensors and doing some gene sequencing for some of the APO alleles. Um, and um, so we're trying to figure out what the genetic abnormality is. They are hyperlipidemic, but they are not severely hyperlipidemic like we see in, most, in some of the really severe cases of miniature sounders. Um, so anyway, so if you see a big, huge, open, clear space in the lumen of a capillary, check and see if it's a miniature sounder. And I think that is I call them lipid emboli on the diagnosis. Um, and I think the next one is the EM. And so do you see that kind of like kind of homogenous, amorphous, semi-osmophilic material? Um, this, actually, this particular lipid embolus lesion looks somewhat similar to, now I'm forgetting the name, um, lipoprotein glomerulopathy in humans, uh, which is a genetic disease in humans. I think it, um, it so our lesions are, are similar, although the EM appearance in our dogs is a little bit different. In humans, it's a little denser, a little more electron dense than what we're seeing here in this particular image. Um, so, um, hopefully we'll have more information about this disease in the future. And I think I have one more uh, set of pictures. So, um, seeing cholesterol clefts um, in glomerular tufts should be very concerning. <laughs> We've only seen it in one dog um, from our biopsy system. In humans, this is pathognomonic for atherombolic disease. So, if you have a coronary cath procedure and you go into renal failure a couple weeks later, and they do a biopsy, I'm on the hunt looking for these cholesterol clefts. And it's, even if I just see one, I have a diagnosis of atherombolic disease. Um, because they go all over the body, and they're going to get trapped in those pulmonary capillaries. They would also be trapped in pulmonary capillaries, but it's much easier to biopsy the kidney for me to look at. And they're in real failure at the same time, so it's a good reason to biopsy the kidney. And that's what it looks like on EM. And this is um, hopefully going to be submitted this week. Michael Martinez is writing this case up. Yeah, this is a particular. This is the only case we've seen in a dog, and the dog um, did not have, uh, had not had a cardiac cath procedure. He was severely um, hypercholesterolemic, and um, was originally proteinuric, and then um, became azotemic, and eventually was euthanized. I think even before he got the EM back, he went into renal failure and didn't come out of it. Um, he was not diabetic. Um, and he was one of the, he was a uh, Sheltie or, yeah, Shetland sheep dog, so we weren't sure about thyroid status. Um, cool. Did the dog have coronary osteoporosis? They didn't do a post, so we don't know. I mean, we're doing a path in practice, so yeah. they didn't do a post. Okay, but you better assume that, it, that this probably isn't a coronary artery in origin, right? I mean, based on how osteoporosis is. So, so there is, if you look at the actual biopsy, there is, there are um, internal, or sorry, um, interlobular vessels that have more cholesterol emboli in them, or not cholesterol emboli, like atherosclerotic plaques in them. So even the renal vessels in one section of the biopsy. Huh? No, it was, no, it, it's a, it's not typical for dogs. It's, yeah, it's sub Um And, I mean, it, it's there. So, it's an interesting case. But. Um, so yeah, so that's another, so don't, you shouldn't have cholesterol clefts in your glomeruli, that is bad. Um, anybody else have questions? Rachel, so if you find, um, you know, obviously if they're biopsying the kidney because it's a proteinuria and you find focal segmental sclerosis or you find a, a, a segmental lipidosis, you've got an answer for them, they're already treating the dog, you know, they just need to adjust what they're doing where they're sort of aware that there's already a glomerular problem. But what do you, uh, you know, suggest to people, like uh, in the case that I had, where they removed the kidney for a separate problem? There was a, a hydronephrosis, there was a ureteritis. The glomerular issue, I think, was a, was a, was a, 
incident, well, not incidental anymore as a very young dog, but uh, it's kind of a surprise finding. So do you have any advice or anything kind of prognostically? Will it, does it, if you find it in one kidney, is it definitely affecting the other? Uh, do you know kind of how it will progress so much at all? Uh, That's a really good question. question. I specifically, I think um, Dr. Baden sent me the, the bias report just for that exact question about what do we do now. Um, and my comment was that um, these dogs um, are occasion are the ones we get biopsies from, the biopsy was for the clinical indication of proteinuria. Um, I told them that they should be tracking the UPC. Um, I don't know if they had done one prior to surgery. I doubt it. Um, and so, uh, and I said that they should start to institute protective therapy now. So already making sure that, you know, if the dog is partnering, don't wait around and we recheck. Um, I don't know how well our standard therapies could intervene in this process um, as opposed to what it would be in a normal FSGS case. I don't know. Um, but those are all those kinds of follow-up questions that we hope to answer with our service by being able to track the progression of those cases. But I, you know, I wouldn't, I couldn't immunosuppress for any of these. Like you wouldn't immunosuppress for either of these two diseases we presented today. Um, you would just be doing, you know, optimizing your, your standard therapy of, you know, ACE inhibition, controlling blood pressure, and maybe a low protein diet. So it's a lot of wait and see. Does that help you? Yep. Thanks. Okay. A couple things. One, the the okay. focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. Um, entity is really a pattern of injury within which, starting in people, there are lots of different uh, subtypes and, and, and it's not a single disease but a pattern of injury in which there are a variety of different diseases. In veterinary medicine, particularly dogs with proteinuria, th this pattern of injury turns out to, to crop up uh, pretty frequently. Uh, and we are just in the beginning stages of figuring out the scope of different things that might cause it uh, and, um, and, and their treatments or potential reversibility and things. So, I, I mean, we're, uh, we're better at recognizing it than we are explaining it. And, and I think that the, the the, the thing we need to avoid trying to do right now is, is, is think that they're all the same, both in etiopathogenesis, prognosis, and treatment. Um, the, and then my, my final comment, going back to the steroids that were mentioned before, it, it, there is a tendency in some circles to want to throw steroids at glomerular disease in dogs. The, my observation is that in comparative nephropathology, if one looks at human renal diseases, glomerular diseases that are highly steroid responsive and none is perfect, but you know, some forms of FSGS and certainly minimal change disease, particularly in children, uh, responds to steroids alone in, uh, in the, on the order of 80%, you know, these kinds of things. The, the, my point is that the forms of glomerular disease that are highly steroid responsive in people are rarely encountered in dogs, and particularly with min, minimal change disease, most everyone we've seen has been associated with a drug uh, uh, exposure idiopathogenesis rather than idiopathic. So I, so I, I'm, you know, I'm just uh, momentarily, if you will, on my soapbox about the. Uh, the, the the lack of a good rationale for throwing steroids at dog glomerular disease. And we had one question here from OSU and then we'll end. Would you predict that the lipid and the glomerular could progress to that embolism by themselves? So that's a very good question. I've had that exact question as well. So the question here was, could a glomerular lipid embolus, like the ones that we saw just clear space, progress to the case that we actually had as a discussion with the foam cells? Um, and I haven't seen any kind of progression within a stool biopsy core. Um, so uh, I, and I've, all, I've often wondered that. Would this, how, how do you get rid of these lipid emboli? Um, I don't know. But I, you would expect if it were something that is, you know, he had one embolus and then eventually there would be some foam cells coming and I've been eating it, and then the next one you would see the lipid embolus. I haven't seen that spectrum. Like I said, we've only seen these glomerular lipid abnormalities 
or this, these lipid emboli in four dogs total. Um, so, I don't know. So, I guess to be continued. Um, we will, I'll post these uh, descriptions and the PowerPoints with some of the images removed as PDF and send you all the link. Um, I hope today it seems like we were really interactive. I appreciate the discussion. Um, and uh, I'll send an email maybe next week if, or next month if we want to do Ask a Renal Pathologist random questions and you guys want to send me snapshots, you guys can quiz me, I guess. Is that okay? Thank you, Jeremy. Welcome. Thank you.